Next, it was time to look at some more of the electronics that needed fitting, starting with the loudspeakers. Now, when I was working on this project, I didn't really know what speakers I was going to use, how big they were, how I was going to fit them or drive them. So I kind of rushed this bit and regret it slightly because I hadn't exactly planned what I was going to do. Ideally, you would have bought a pair of speakers before, speaker cones, and therefore you'd know exactly the sizes and, and how it was going to uh, fit together. What I did do was a little bit of research. I, I went onto Arcade World and they sold some kits with uh, 100 mil or four inch speakers. So I just used those measurements. I asked Ben to add those to his drawing. And some people have them on the panel that faces down on top of the screen. Some people have them on the rear panel. I put them on the rear panel. It doesn't really matter. They work perfectly well there. So I had two circles there with four pre-drilled um, holes to screw them on. So in the end, I did end up buying this basic speaker kit from Arcade World and they charged £21.59 for a pair of basic speakers and a very simple 12 volt amplifier and some pretty cheap wiring. Not a lot of money. I am a hi-fi enthusiast. So obviously, I was quite horrified by the quality of it, but it was just for starters. It's like a kind of really basic little car um, amplifier. It didn't come with a power supply, so I bought a separate 12 volt power supply, which cost me £13.98. Now, there's a few other parts in this build that use uh, 12 volts, so if you also have some additional parts that need it, make sure you buy a power supply that's got enough current to support some of those other parts. Uh, for me, that was to power the uh, coin mechanism where you actually put the coin in to have that register and also some uh, white LED lights that were going to be used to backlight the marquee. This is the actual name of the arcade machine, which was another thing I hadn't given a great deal of thought. So I'll come to that in just a moment. Um, and you can see a test here where I wired it all up together. I've got the, the coin mechanism, the LED lights for the uh, marquee display and also the um, the amplifier driving the speakers. And what I noticed was there's quite a lot of background hiss on this. I tried changing the um, the wiring. I tried just powering it, powering the amplifier without powering anything else. It's not ideal. It works fine, but it's there's room for improvement there. So if you're planning an arcade build, you might want to put a little bit of extra thought and uh, effort into choosing some loudspeakers before you put it all together and an amplifier that's that you're satisfied with and, and then look at ways you can accommodate all of that within a build. I think I might look at PC speakers next time because some of those work pretty well. In terms of the coin mechanism, this was something that I always had in mind because obviously if it's if you're trying to emulate an authentic coin operated arcade machine, it's going to need a coin mechanism or at least a mock-up of it somewhere where you could put a coin in or pretend. And uh, generally speaking, they involve a metal door with a lock on it. Inside that door, you would have some sort of access to like a bucket that would collect the coins. I had forgotten to accommodate that or where I would put that. So uh, that part's not working particularly well. And the coin mechanism itself, they vary in complexity. Um, but the one that the model that I got, which is the one that's sold by Ultimark, can be configured to recognize a variety of different coins. And it recognizes the shape and I think maybe even the weight of them as well. So you can change it to work with for me, it would have been old 10p coins or in America, it would be quarters or you can use plastic tokens. You can use anything you want really uh, to drive this thing. But I found it was very sensitive and very particular to the type of coins. And I got it working for a while, but then it stopped working properly. And in the end, it proved very frustrating. And it's a critical part of the build if you're going to use it, because it's the thing that actually gives the credit to the game that then lets you start to play the game. So without the coin insertion, you can't play any of these vintage games. And that's why I mentioned earlier along in the video that you may want to accommodate an additional button in your build somewhere that is also wired into this system so that when you press it, it inserts a coin. So the software thinks you've inserted a coin. I've got one uh, spare button that's around the back of uh, the cabinet and I just reach around and press it and bingo, you've got a coin. Um, I do intend to get the coin met working because it was quite expensive and it is a proper authentic part. In the end, I paid £61.51 for the coin mechanism, the lockable door and also the LED lights for the marquee and I got those from Ultimark. 
Now on to one of the final but most important parts of the entire build, and that is the artwork. Now there's actually quite a lot of artwork on there on these cabinets. You typically have pictures on the two side panels. You have the marquee itself, which is the name of the game. That's normally on some sort of transparent plastic, so it can be backlit and illuminated. You normally have some artwork that goes around the screen, some artwork around the control panel, and also some around the front. The one at the bottom is called the kick plate. And actually, just as a quick aside, in one of my original drawings one of my original designs I did toy with the idea of actually having the lower half of the machine below the control panel open so that you could get closer to it while sat down uh, on a chair but in the end I, I just put a wooden panel and the coin mech in there so um oh, and by the way the coin mech door can also be opened up to give you more access to some of the controls again you've got to think about how you're going to wire this thing up but we're talking about artwork here and fortunately, a bunch of very dedicated individuals have scanned, cleaned up, retouched, or even completely recreated high resolution versions of most classic arcade machine artwork. And if you do searches online, you will find most of what you're looking for. Um, if you're doing a sort of generic arcade machine, again, there's some people who provide artwork that they've created without, or you might want to create your own. You could do a, a, a kind of... Uh, monster mix of uh, your favorite elements for a while i thought about having space invader sides um, or bits of pac-man but in the end i wanted to be a purist and just go down a complete pure gallagher route so i found the artwork for that and for the side panels and the kick plate that was pretty easy because that just involved scaling it to fit in terms of the marquee i hadn't actually measured the original and it wasn't tall enough on the original machines that section is very very tall and mine was shorter so I had to scale down the logo and then have some extra space on the side. Now it's pretty easy to do the scaling and redrawing and things like Photoshop but the pieces that required the most work in my build were the control panel artwork and also the bezel that goes around the screen. Now as you may recall the control panel was based on an original Gallagher control panel but which had accommodated an additional fire button to give it more flexibility for games like Scramble where you fire and bomb, but then also scaled down to three quarters the original size. The problem which I mentioned earlier was that that scaling meant that because I was still using full size buttons, I had to provide more room for them, bigger holes, space it out more. And in doing so, some of the text was obscured and it looked messy. It didn't look like this is how it was intended to be seen. So I got the control panel artwork, I overlaid my new holes and areas where the buttons and joystick would go, and then I basically just cut out and copied and pasted sections and moved them around. Some of them I completely removed, like uh, there was a section on the original artwork that told you how the buttons worked, I got rid of that. To provide more room for some other sections there were some other instructions that i took out and then i created some more graphics to go around the second fire button to look like it had always intended to be there so again if you're an absolute purist and you're intimate with these designs you might go oh that looks different that's not the same thing but if you just glance at it you'll think no that's that looks real that looks how it's supposed to be because i've kind of redesigned it and I had to do the same with the bezel. And this is uh, like a cut out square section that will go over the screen. The idea is that you use it to mask the edges of the screen and any other gubbins that are inside the cabinet. But of course, you will need to modify that to fit the size and shape of the screen that you're using. Again, for me, it was just a case of measuring the TV screen, putting it roughly in the middle, making sure that the TV could actually achieve that position in the final cabinet when, when uh, assembled, because you wouldn't want that hole to be in the wrong place and the TV be, be off to one side. That wouldn't be good at all. And then for me, I needed to just like copy and paste more of those spacey elements to fill in the gaps. And while I was doing it, I noticed in the bottom right hand corner, there was the uh, Midway or Bally logo. And I thought, wait a minute, I've got a font that looks a lot like that. So because I had to recreate it, I decided to use my own name. So I've, I've switched that to Lang. And I also did that in the, um, the marquee artwork as well. So that was a, a bit of fun. I just made one mistake, though. On the marquee artwork, again, I needed to extend the uh, black portions on the left and right side. And I missed out one pixel, one pixel width, a line that was one pixel width at one and that you can't see on the final print, but when it's backlit, yeah, you see a thin vertical line. So that's something that I might 
get done again in the future because that single part was only about £12 to print on some Perspex. I used a local printing service, Exhibit, uh, Exhibit Printing in Brighton, uh, to do all of those vinyl stickers. And to do all the vinyl stickers and also to print the marquee on Perspex and to print the bezel uh, and apply it to a thin sheet of MDF that they then cut the hole out of because again I don't have the knife or the the tools to do a, a decent crisp job of that they charged me 150 pounds and 84 pence in total and that makes it the single most expensive part or component of this entire build of this entire project but it's worth every penny because once you put those stickers on this entire thing comes to life and it just looks like the beautiful piece of furniture that you'd always wanted. Now you've stuck stickers before, right? You don't need me to tell you how to do it, or do you? Well, if you're sticking stickers which are this big, there are some tricks you can employ to apply them more easily. I, I looked online, I saw what most people do is they cut roughly around the edge of the sticker and then they use masking tape to tape it into position so it's exactly where you want it and then you go down to say the bottom and you begin to peel off a section and you stick that down and you peel more and more of it off and, and gradually fold that sticker on and you apply it and that eliminates any chance of air bubbles and you get a really nice finish and of course because you had it taped in place it's exactly where you want it to be. The only thing I would add is that over time the stickiness on the back of the sticker wasn't quite sticky enough. Maybe it was the paint that I'd used Maybe it was the glue that the sticker used. But in the end, they did began to peel off the bigger stickers on the side. So uh, I had to just uh, put some glue behind them and, and stick those into place. The bezel around the screen was another part that I struggled with in this project because looking closely at different arcade machines, new and old, you see that everyone does them a bit differently. You've got to hold the artwork in place, generally put a sheet of glass on top of it and then stop that sliding off or getting in the way. Or And again, tea molding and other bits of plastic are, are often used to join the various gaps and hold it in place. But I didn't want to do that. I wanted it to look nicer. Now, when I assembled this, I'd used uh, wooden battens uh, underneath the control panel surface and the control panel just stopped. So I basically had a 12 millimeter depth. To work with and then those two buttons went up the entire rear side of uh, the inside of uh, the cabinet to the rear panel at the back and when it was all assembled you essentially had a tray that was 12 millimeters deep and resting on these wooden buttons along the side my idea was that the artwork would be mounted on foam board or um, in this case uh, MDF because that's what the printer had that would go on and then I'd stick a sheet of glass on top and both of those are on a slope and they would just basically kind of rest against the uh, edge of the control panel and because the panel itself was 12 mil deep that's the depth that I had to work with which I thought would be plenty and it was the MDF that was used in the end was about four millimeters thick and I approached a local glazing company Shaw's in Brighton and uh, they quoted me 30 pounds for a sheet of six millimeter clear toughened glass. I think six mil is probably a bit excessive, but I could accommodate it. The price was right and there's no chance of it breaking. So they made it. And of course, because you go to a professional glass cutter, they will cut it to the exact dimensions you require. And it just fitted in and began. And again, because the panels had been cut by a computer and were perfectly square, it just fitted. There was no, oh, it doesn't quite fit at one end. I'm going to have to cut a bit out or shave it. It just slotted in perfectly. And then if you want to remove it, you can go in through the back of the arcade machine and, and push it out. And it just stays in place without any additional fixings. It's perfectly safe. And there is a little ridge where it goes down a tiny amount. And that's enough for you to rest those 10p coins or quarters to indicate that it's your turn to play next. After wiring up the controls, I inserted the TV set in the tray that I'd built earlier. The tray allowed it to slide in and out and keep it upright and fairly square with the surface of uh, the glass above it. But there was, of course, a bit of a gap between the top of the TV set and the glass and the bezel. It was about half an inch in my case. And unfortunately, that meant that you could actually see the TV cabinet just if you kind of peered around the edges of that cutout in the bezel shape and worst of all you could actually see through the back of the cabinet because of course there was no back panel on it and that didn't look particularly good so I needed something to mask all of that off so I cut out some black foam and 
made a rectangular shape with it and just kind of wedged it in between the top of the TV set and the lower part of the glass. Now there was just one extra consideration for my particular build which is that if you're using the latest version of the RGB Pi cable, it does a very useful trick of automatically switching the TV into its RGB mode. So it's ready to accept the signal that your Raspberry Pi is sending it. But mine's an older version of the cable and you actually have to switch it manually either by pressing a button on the front of the TV, which of course you can't reach because there's a sheet of glass and a load of foam in front of it, or by using the infrared remote control that came with it, which I still have and still works. But of course it needs access to the actual infrared sensor on the front of the TV so I've had to leave a little gap in the foam um, that I've wedged in between the top of the TV and, and that glass sheet in order for that infrared signal to go through just in order to switch the TV into RGB mode. It's a pain and it's silly uh, but I will resolve this by getting a newer version of the RGB Pi cable that will switch it automatically but again these are all things you have to think about especially when you lock away things like the TV set within a, a box you've got to think how am I going to operate this thing or do I need to operate it or have access to any of the controls now at this point the cabinet is actually fully operational or mostly operational you can play games on it you can see them you can hear them the marquees backlit the loudspeakers work you can play games on it and have a good time and that's what it's designed to do and unfortunately when a project like this is roughly 95 to 98 percent complete someone like me is happy to just really draw a line under it and say it's fine it's finished just just play it enjoy it looks good it works well no need to do anything else but if you are a completer finisher or you do have a bit of spare time there are a few things that I would want to do to improve this the first is the wiring on the inside at the moment it's just all kind of dangling around it's absolutely fine it works it doesn't pose any problems or dangers but it could do with tidying up so I tidy up the cabling within the second thing I do is to really improve how I've mounted the uh, the marquee that's the name of the game at the top of the cabinet now when I originally designed this I didn't give it that much thought when I look back at my original plans I just had one panel at the bottom and one panel at the top so they were even going at different angles and I imagined in my head that I would just somehow wedge or rest the uh, the marquee in there but of course that's not going to work what I ended up doing was uh, using those spare bits of uh, quadrants that I didn't use to round off the control panel. And I put one at the top and one at the bottom. So they rounded around. And then the idea was to wedge in the marquee artwork between them. But at the moment, it's only being held by friction and it does fall out from time to time. And I've still got that little one pixel wide line that you can see shining through sometimes. So I'd like to make that look a bit better. But I did like the way those quadrants look because that's not how they're done on normal arcade machines and yet it does look I think quite smart and deliberate it doesn't look like something you've improvised which is always a good thing right another thing is I'd like to tidy up the wiring on the mains electricity there's three mains devices in the cabinet as it stands there's the tv set of course there's the 12 volt power supply that does the loudspeakers the coin mech and the uh, marquee backlight and there's the 5 volt power supply for the raspberry pi at the moment they're all connected plugged into a strip adapter around the back of uh, the cabinet but it'd be nice if that strip adapter was inside the cabinet and then if the cable for that came out to maybe a plug with an on off switch it would be really nice to be able to switch everything on with one switch whereas at the moment I actually just kind of switch it on and off at the wall which again isn't ideal is it? it's not very neat so I would like to improve the electrical mains electricity side of that on top of that it would also be good to tidy up that foam surround that I made on the uh, to wedge between the top of the tv screen and the uh, glass sheet above it and at the same time replace that RGB Pi cable with the latest version to automatically switch it into RGB mode. Oh and that coin mechanism it'd be really nice to get that working properly and not only get it working properly but also to accommodate some sort of bucket to catch the coins or tokens behind it because right now when you put a coin in it just falls straight onto the floor uh, and rolls out uh, either to the front or forever lost uh, behind it which obviously isn't ideal either but let's not worry about that quite yet. Looking back I think if I was to give anyone advice based on what I did if you're starting this project afresh 
is again, not only to think about the games that you want to play, but to actually set them up and start playing them straight away. Make a control panel, even if it's just a mock-up, and see how those controls work with the front end that you're using. For me, it was the, the operating system and front end that came with the RGB Pi, but you may be using something else. There's so many different versions and front ends for, for emulators like MAME and other platforms. But if you play it for any length of time, you'll go, do you know what? I, I'm having to keep pressing the escape key on the computer keyboard. So obviously I need a button to, to emulate that, to provide that access or, and I don't, I'm not gonna be using a coin mechanism. So I want an easy to access um, coin insertion button, that sort of thing. See how you're gonna use it and then work out how that's gonna be fitted into your design. And also, I mean, I, I rushed ahead with things like the marquee and the loudspeakers because I just wanted to get this thing built. It had been playing around in my mind for the best part of 20 years. And I just had to build it now that I had a little bit of time. But I wish I had given a little bit of extra thought to how I was going to accommodate those loudspeakers. And again, if I'm going to correct or improve anything in the future, I would like to use a better quality amplifier and cabling so that that hiss is reduced and the sound quality is improved. But it's amazing that once you start playing it, you don't hear any of that and you're just completely involved in the games. And ultimately that's what it's all about. I'm really pleased with the way that this project turned out. I wanted a cabinet that looked good and was crisply finished and just nicely designed. And this is something that wouldn't have been possible if I tried to build it by hand, if I'd actually cut out those pieces myself and tried to finish them with my limited woodworking skills and tools. It only worked as well as it did because I actually did a proper, or had a friend create a proper computer-aided design diagram and then feed that to a machine that automatically cut it out so that those pieces were absolutely symmetrical perfectly curved, perfectly smooth, and just a really, really nice. So if you have better woodworking skills than I, I salute you. But if you don't, you don't have to think, I can't possibly make a project like this. It really is possible. And I hope that this video, even though it's been rather long and torturous, very much like the process itself, I hope that it's given you some inspiration to perhaps design your own arcade cabinet, whether it's a, an upright full-size design, whether it's a tabletop, even if you're using an LCD monitor or an old computer, there's lots of different ways that you can do this and you can have a lot of fun with the visuals. I've really enjoyed playing with the machine and putting together this, so I hope you found it useful. If you have built anything or you've got any questions, please put them in the comments below and I've put on links to all of the resources that I used. So I hope that you find those useful. If you'd like to see more videos like this, please give me a like and subscribe to this channel because I'll be posting more videos about technology, retro gaming and all the good stuff. So thanks again for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye bye.